Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, and um, I, I, I must be guilty. Apparently, we're all we're all beholden to corporate corporate interests and and corporations. I don't know if the strings are visible to people today, but I'm just a puppet, apparently, uh, for corporate interests. It's all based on conspiracies. It reminds me of there was a great movie, Team America, and, and one of the characters in that movie was asked to explain all these their, their claims about corporations and said, oh yeah, well corporations are out there and they do corporation-y things and they go and make money and there's no evidence here at all. There is no evidence. And I have not just sat through and listened to Senator Ludlam's speech. I have read Senator Wish Wilson's, uh, Senator Wish -Wilson, sorry, uh, first contribution, his second reading speech, and also flicked through uh, Senator Di Natale's speech. And there's no evidence. They have provided no evidence at all. Just they have only relied on base conspiracy theorists. That is where the Greens are ending up right now. They are relying on conspiracy theories rather than evidence. Because if these things were so bad, if these things were so bad, Mr. Deputy President, we would have some evidence of their ill effect. We would have some ill effect because, because, well, you are putting this bill up. You are putting this bill up, and the evidence is on the 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 the, the requirement is on people bringing a bill to this chamber to provide evidence of why we should put it in place. We should not put legislation in place where there's not an identifiable problem that needs to be fixed. I think we can all agree on that. That's why we should pass laws in this place, to fix a problem that exists. Now, where is the problem? Because we have, we have already four FTAs with ISDS provisions in them. We have 21 uh, bilateral trade agreements, bilateral investment agreements with other nations with ISDS provisions in them. Uh, some of those agreements go back 25 years. Uh, now, if there was a problem with these provisions, you would think they would, um, they would have manifested themselves. We've got agreements with Singapore, Thailand, ASEAN uh, and New Zealand, all with, these agreement, all with these provisions, but no problems. I won't name the 21 countries, but there's plenty of them there as well we have other agreements with. Now, um, over those 25 years, over those whole 25 years, and it's not something that none of, the, none of the Green Senators have mentioned. In 25 years, how many cases do you think Australian, the Australian government has been subject to under these provisions? How many cases? Senator Wish Wilson, you probably know. How many cases? How many cases? One. One. I'll get to the Productivity Commission, Senator Wish Wilson. One case. One case. One case, and that case has not even been resolved yet. That's, this is the well-known case brought by Philip Morris on, on plain packaging regulations. It has not been resolved. We're, uh, one case, one case, and I'll get to the international evidence too, Senator Wish Wilson. But you did raise the issue of the Productivity Commission, and I, I do think the Productivity Commission has been verbal a little because I've noticed that um, some of the Green senators have taken to quoting the Productivity Commission as saying that we should not include these provisions in in ISDS agreements. Well, actually, let's read the whole quote from what the Productivity Commission said. The Productivity Commission said, not yes, yeah, selective quoting, I wouldn't expect the Greens to do that, uh, Senator Colbeck, but there's a first time for everything. This is the quote. This is exactly what the Productivity Commission said. That Australian governments should seek to avoid the inclusion of ISDS provisions in BRTAs, bilateral regional trade agreements. Hang on. That grant foreign investors in Australia substantive or procedural rights greater than those enjoyed by Australian investors. And I don't dispute that view. But the Greens always leave out that little bit, that it's only those bits that provide substantively greater procedural rights. But that has not happened in any of these agreements. And if it would have, we would have seen that evidence. Because I listened, I listened to uh, uh, Senator Ludlam earnestly worry about how uh, this, this provision could stop us dealing with fracking and, and I think nuclear or uranium mining and all these other things. But if you go, if you actually Read the Korean FTA we've only just signed, and in Chapter 18, which deals with the environment, which deals with these issues that Senator Ludlam raised, the very first clause, 18 or very first article, 18.1 in that chapter says, and I'll quote: "Recognising the right of each party to establish its own levels of environmental protection and its own environmental development priorities, and to adapt or modify accordingly its environmental laws, regulations, and policies." Each party shall endeavour to ensure that its laws, regulations and policies provide for and encourage high levels of environmental protection and shall endeavour to continue to improve its respective levels of environmental protection, including through such environmental laws, regulations and policies. There, is no, there are no restrictions against a country 
uh, acting to protect its environment under the Korean FTA nor under any of the other bilateral investment agreements um, we have, and the Greens have quoted from no, none of these ISDS clauses, ISDS agreements we've had to prove otherwise. Now, Senator Wish Wilson also um, raised the point about uh, the international evidence. And, uh, uh, it is true that, that internationally there's a lot much, more, lot much much more experience associated with ISDS clauses. There are actually across the world 2,400 bilateral investment treaties in place. 2,400. 90 per cent of those um, bilateral investment treaties uh, have not actually had a single investor claim, a single claim under them for a treaty breach. So only 10 per cent or less than 10 per cent of these 2,400 agreements have actually even been triggered at once. once. Uh, now, um, sometimes I didn't hear Senator Ludlam say this, but sometimes people claim that um, the, uh, there's been this surge in, in, in uh, ISDS claims. Uh, there has been an increase. I don't know the numbers of the exact increases in claims here um, right now. But the key point to make is that, uh, that these increases are proportional to the amount of outward foreign um, capital investment that has occurred in the world. And, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use props, but there is a graph there from a report I've read this morning uh, which shows very clearly that the number of claims—and they, they have risen—I do have the figures here, sorry—they've risen to about 600 a year now, we are averaging, of ISTS claims. But that is directly proportional to the increase in foreign direct investment um, across the world. And it's a very good thing. It's a very good thing that um, we do have more foreign direct investment. Um, it has allowed uh, particularly developing economies uh, uh, in increase their growth considerably over the past 50 years. When you think about, yeah, okay, I'll take that interjection, Senator Wishman. Why do we leave it out of the US free trade agreement? Because we didn't need it with the US. They, they, we, 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 we believe, we believe, we should evaluate these things on a case-by-case -case basis. Oils ain't oils. Oils ain't oils, Senator Wish Wilson. We should evaluate through you, Deputy Ch Deputy President. Sorry, we should evaluate these things as we see fit. Now, we don't need that with the US because both Australia and the United States have very strong protections against property rights. So there, there wasn't a need for it. So let's look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, I was talking about foreign direct investment before I was interrupted. In 1959, um, we had uh, the global stock of FDI was just 60 billion US dollars. Not a lot of money at all uh, in the context of things, in the context of the world economy. But today, today, it exceeds $25 trillion. Now, that is an, a massive growth, and it's a very important growth, because it has allowed particularly countries that are poorer and lack capital to access capital from overseas countries. Now, and, and the reason they've, one of the reasons, I shouldn't say the only reason, but one of the reasons that's allowed, been allowed to grow is thanks to these investment treaties, because it gives investors in largely developed countries, because that's where the capital is, uh, the, protection, the protection and the rights to make sure order, that it's— um, uh, Senator Canavan, just take your seat. Senator Fawcett on a point of order. Standing Order 197, Mr Deputy President. Um, well, I can say that, that interjections which aren't actually disrupting the debate are sometimes tolerated by the chair, particularly if they do facilitate the exchange of views and arguments in a debate. However, if Senator Canavan uh, does seek the protection of the chair, I will certainly provide him with that protection. I'm, 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 I'm new to this, so perhaps I, I should, but I, look, I'm quite enjoying it, and, and I think uh, the, the Green Senators are enjoying Senator it. Senator Canavan, continue. you have the call. I, I will let you know, um, uh, Mr Deputy President, if, if uh, my position changes in that regard. Um, but uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, th these protections have been very important to facilitate uh, that investment because Prior to these investments, to these uh, um, uh, protections coming in, into place, um, it was, excuse me, it was quite uh, common um, for um, uh, uh, governments, uh, particularly developing countries, to expropriate um, property and or to nationalise property uh, and to therefore um, take away uh, the investments that uh, that um, uh, foreign countries had made. Indeed, according to the United Nations. Um, uh, some evidence presented by the United Nations in a paper here that, that I read this morning. The 14 years prior to the entry into force of the first bilateral investment treaty, uh, there were 875 government takings of foreign investor property in 62 countries, 
for which there was no effective remedy. Uh, interna international law at the time provided very few protections uh, for investors in those cases. Uh, and me it meant that, of course, there was a chilling effect on that foreign investment, and many people wouldn't do that. Uh, now, I, I, I support foreign investment, uh, particularly on the global scale. It is very, very important, and I, I, I don't understand particularly why the Greens are so, seemingly in this case, so anti it. Uh, because uh, in other instances, the Greens Party are very cosmopolitan, very multicultural, and, and that's a fantastic thing. We should seek to have a world that shrinks and becomes narrow, and, we, and, and tighten our relationships with each other. And investment certainly does that. Trade helps. Trade helps build relations. Trade helps make sure countries stay friendly between each other, but investment does it even more because um, when, you, when you buy something at the shop, you have a relationship with the shopkeeper, um, but when you invest in his business, uh, you, you, have a, you have a permanent relationship. And we should seek to encourage that between countries. Because I'd also say that this, the, these, these treaties, these agreements, have allowed us to move away from uh, what was sometimes called gunboat diplomacy, and then that was a regrettable period in American history. But, but um, uh, many times uh, the US government in the 19th century in particular and into the 20th century used its military force to, to ensure that its investors were protected and its trade rights um, were maintained. Uh, um, but uh, that wasn't, I think we'd all agree, the right way to go about things. And, and these new treaties have allowed um, uh, investors from the US, but actually more from Europe, the evidence is European um, investors have been the biggest users of these clauses, um, have allowed them protections without the need to resort to governments offering military threats or, in worst case, military, actual military, military interventions. Um, it is much better that we should draw jaw rather than war war, and of course we are going to have disagreements uh, through these agreements, uh, and sometimes we might not get the best results we like, although, as I said earlier, that has not happened to Australia yet, um, but it's much better that we resolve these disputes through, through a legal process uh, rather than a, um, uh, than, a, than a more direct and violent one. Um, I also just wanted to go to, to some of the evidence in the international jurisprudence, and it goes to some of the points Senator Ludlam was making, that somehow uh, these, these provisions undermine uh, the ability of governments to put in place environmental or, or health protections. Uh, in fact, that is not true at all. That is not true at all when you look, actually look at the jurisprudence. Um, there was a, uh, a case under the NAFTA agreement, which includes a ISCS clause, and, and the NAFTA agreement is, a, is the North, North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, the United States and Mexico. There was a case brought by uh, Chemtura, a chemical company, uh, and, it, was versed, and it, it, it brought the Canadian government uh, to court. The investor challenged Canadian pesticide regulations, but the tribunal in this case ruled against uh, Chemtura on all claims, and the panel expressly recognised Canada's right to make scientific and environmental regulatory decisions. There was another NAFTA case called uh, Methanex versus the United States. Uh, again, the tribunal dismissed all of Methanex's claims of discriminatory treatment and expropri expropriation, noting that as a matter of general international law, a non-discriminatory regulation for a public purpose which is enacted in accordance with due process and affects foreign investors, there's a direct quote from the court ruling, is not deemed expro expropriatory and compensable unless specific commitment has been given by the regulating government to the then putative foreign investor contemplating investment that the government would refrain from such regulation. Again, there are, there are, there are, there are well-known protections both in ISDS agreements and in general trade law that allow, um, allow um, a, um, uh, governments to, to regulate in the public good. But that's not to say these agreements have, have been without effect. Um, they are not, uh, uh, they are not uh, completely timid. They do offer protection, these agreements, and they have, in fact, offered protection to Australian investors because what is often lost here is that it is a two-way street. Uh, while uh, these agreements do, of course, protect overseas investors in Australia, um, um, they, they do protect our investors, Australian investors, in overseas. And recently, there's been two cases of Australian companies making use of ISDS uh, clauses. In November 2011, uh, a tribunal awarded White, Australia's, White Industries Australia Limited, uh, which is an Australian mining company, compensation from the Indian government for violating the India-Australia agreement. Um, there was another case recently in 2011 where a copper company, Australian copper company, Tethian Copper Company, 
formally commenced ISDS provisions against the government of Pakistan, uh, and in December 2012, uh, Planet Mining, another Australian company, has requested the government of Indonesia uh, to consider a claim under, the, under a clause in that um, international agreement. I mean, so it's important that our that our um, investors and our companies um, have the protection of um, of these 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 agreements. Um, I, um, I, I think, uh, Mr Deputy President, that property rights should be something that we do try and uphold and protect. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised that the Greens don't put high, as high a price on the protection of property rights and other members in this chamber. Um, but we do have international agreements that cover human rights, um, uh, that cover protection against torture and, uh, and other um, internationally recognised um, rights issues, but property rights as well are extremely important, and the, and the protection of property rights uh, goes back right to the start of the Enlightenment, Enlightenment and the Declaration of Independence in the United States, and it's enshrined in our constitution as well, where the government must give just comp compensation where it, where it um, acquires property. Uh, but we should also make sure it's enshrined in, in these agreements as well, because sometimes, sometimes courts can look more fondly on domestic investors than they do on foreign investors. So we should seek that the same kind of protections we think are right and proper in our constitution uh, that exist in other constitutions, such as America and the American governments, uh, are, are similarly recognised in this agreement. Because one reason I think uh, the Greens are promoting something like this is that they don't really believe in that. They don't really believe that property rights should always and everywhere be protected. That property rights uh, are on a par with other types of rights, and that government should not be given licence to simply take, um, take property uh, from people without due compensation. And there is a particular issue in Queensland at the moment that has been long-standing Greens policy that is going to be very detrimental to regional areas and the farming community. Uh, if a new Labor government in Queensland, as they have promised to do, seeks to reintroduce tree-clearing laws into that state, I bet you. I bet you they will not offer a cent of compensation to farmers, even though they previously had the right uh, to, to uh, clear property on their land, to develop it, to make it worth value. And that value, of course, was embodied in the price they paid for the property. The price they paid for a property included a right to, to clear the trees on their land, to develop the land, to put irrigation in, to put better pasture in, to put more head of cattle on and to make more money. But about um, now, going back almost 15 years ago, that was changed in Queensland by the former Labor government. They introduced these laws which stripped all of those rights away from farmers, and, and uh, perhaps, perhaps some greater protection did need to be put in place, but compensation should have been given. In my view, compensation should be given when we, in this place, using the powers we have, because sometimes <coughs> in these debates it's presented as if governments are these weak and timid. Uh, vulnerable <coughs> institutions that are beholden to corporations where nothing could be close. No, that is not the truth. We are very powerful. And when we use those powers to take things from people, particularly small businesses and farmers, we should, be, we should have the guts to stump up with the cash to compensate for that taking of rights. Now, um, if, if we in this chamber had tried to pass the kinds of laws that Queensland had, um, I think there would have been possibly a claim under Section 51 of the Constitution. Um, for farmers, but the Queensland government is not bound by those provisions in our constitution, unfortunately. Um, uh, in America, they are. The states are, I think it's a, the Fifth Amendment in the United States, where due process must be followed uh, for the taking of property. Uh, that actually does bind um, American state governments, but it doesn't here in this country, unfortunately. Um, so uh, these, these provisions are something that goes to the heart of what we on this side of the chamber believe that property rights should be protected. Um, that we as government should not um, abuse our powers uh, um, in, in, uh, in taking from those that are weaker uh, and more vulnerable than us. Now, I would say, as I, I said to an interjection earlier, that uh, uh, in saying all of that, uh, we, we on this side of the chamber do not insist or believe that all trade agreements need an ISDS clause. Uh, that, um, that, as was noted by Senator Wish Wilson, uh, in the U.S. Free Trade Agreement, we didn't put that in place. We didn't put that in place. In the Korean Free Trade Agreement, we put um, much more additional protections than had previously existed with ISDS clauses uh, to ensure that the governments do have the power to regulate in the, for the general public good and order. 
um, we also, I also make the point that there is some, I think, limitation or shortcoming in the way this bill is drafted, uh, because uh, as, as it is drafted, it would stop us from entering into all um, agreements which have an ISDS clause, even if that agreement exempted us from those clauses. Uh, so there could clearly be a case, even in the TPP, where we could be exempted from some obligations. Um, that would then fall foul of this particular bill if it was passed. So I don't think it's drafted in a way um, which we should pass as this chamber. It would un um, reasonably restrict the role of the executive government uh, in, in, in negotiating and signing agreements which promote trade for Australians and protect their investment rights.